Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? All good? Um, I will speak louder if not. Um, it's really lovely to have you all here today to join us at St Bride. Um, this is our first event for the Friends of St Bride after the summer, so it's just really, really lovely to be back and see you all here today. Um, if you don't know, I am Becky, and um, I sort of help run the events um, programme at St Bride. So if you didn't know, all the ticket funds from tonight's talk go to basically help keep St Bride Library running and um, hopefully keep it running for future generations to enjoy. So thanks so much for coming along and being with us and supporting us in this way. We do really appreciate it, especially at the moment through these testing times. Um, we would like to thank the, thank the Wink into Words Society Charitable Trust for their generosity in sponsoring this lecture. They basically give us some money every year for students to come along to the talk. So if you're one of those students, a special welcome to you. And also, I can't fail to mention Google who help us live stream our events and again their support is very much appreciated. As we are live streaming this event please do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties with the lecture. If this happens we will try to rectify this as quickly as possible. For anyone on Zoom if you are experiencing technical issues your end sometimes logging out and back in again or turning it on off and on again um, can help. But if you do have continued difficulties, you'll be able to watch the recording, which we'll email you in the next week. So please don't stress out too much. Um, and also, please can all of our Zoom attendees make sure that they are muted. Um, and for our in-person guests, please can you make sure that your mobiles are turned on silent. We don't mind you taking photographs, so, but please just make sure the flash isn't turned on because it can just get a bit distracting for the speaker. Um, so for anyone else... Um, attending in person, we would like to just make you aware that if the fire alarm goes off, this will be one continuous bell. And the meeting point for this is out in Salisbury Square, which is through reception, through the front door, through the archway and out to a sort of square where there's a monument. And if that way is blocked and that's where the fire is, then we will direct you down past the, down the second staircase out of these doors, head down past the theatre in the theatre bar without getting a drink on the way, and then we'll meet out in the street and guide you up round. So in case of a fire, you should hopefully be prepared, but hopefully that won't happen. For anyone at home, hopefully you've got your own procedures in place. So we aren't in charge of those, but we just want to make sure everyone is prepared as possible and we can now chill out and have a lovely evening now the boring stuff is over. So I now have to look at my slides to remember what I'm going to say. So we have some fantastic talks coming up that may or may not be of interest to you. If they're not in your main interest area, come along anyway, because all the talks we hold are fantastic. And you'll just learn something new that you may not have known about before. I used to do that, and that's how I got involved in the events. And there's always something for everyone. They're always brilliant. You meet a great crowd. So we have astoundingly brilliant Kate Greenaway medal-winning illustrator author Emily Gravitt talking in... October and all the details of all these talks are on our website so if you can't remember what I've said I mean fair enough you're here to hear Bob talk rather than me so please do just go on our website and have a look I can't recommend her enough she'll be absolutely brilliant and she's just a creative mastermind she's fantastic we have the annual Beatrice Ward memorial lecture being given in when is it? 10th of, 10th of November. And she, it, this talk is really special because it's been given by Nicholas Barker, who actually knew Beatrice really, really well for a long time. So it will be a talk about her and her life and her work from someone he knew really well. So it should be a really fantastic insight into this incredible woman and the legacy and all she's done for St. Bride and typography and everything like that. So again, another really interesting, different talk for us. And hopefully... oh. And also, if you didn't know, we have a print workshop downstairs where you can do letterpress workshops, book binding, wood engraving. They're all fantastically run by really knowledgeable, brilliant people who worked on Fleet Street during its heyday and by really great technicians and craftspeople. So they're for any ability, any age. So do check those out if you fancy learning a new skill. Um, we also have our library, which is upstairs, and it's got an incredible collection of things, which I could talk about all night, as could Bob, which will be for another day, I'm sure. Um, and these are our opening hours up here, and they are by appointment only, so do book in advance. But if you don't quite know what we are and what we do and what we have here, go on a website, have a look, and you'll just be amazed at what treasure we hold in this building. It's just absolutely amazing. And then we also, finally, last bit from me, is we run tours every month where you can have more of an overview and a tour of this labyrinthine building. It's absolutely fantastic. 
and you'll get to hear about some of the treasures in our collection, go down to the workshop and have a look around there. I think they're about a tenner a person, so they're absolutely brilliant. So if you haven't done one, I would highly recommend it. And I think that's it from all the selling points. So hopefully something will tickle your fancy and you'll be back with us again very soon. Oh, and we also have a digitisation launch next week hold on Tuesday from 7, 6.30pm. So we're basically having a celebration to... Um, because we've basically been digitising some of the incredible type specimens from our collection. So if you would like to come along, you can find out about it on our website or just turn up. I'm sure that's absolutely fine. And it will be a fantastic evening to find out more about these beautiful specimens that you can now look at online. And do go and find out about them online as well. We've been recently tweeting about them. So if you want to go and have a look on Twitter, find out more about them there and find the link. So now, without further ado, I would like to introduce... Tonight's speaker, Bob Richardson, who has been working with the St. Bride Library since about 2012. Um, prior to this, Bob worked at the BBC in the presentation and exhibition departments for 35 years. During this time, he walked, never walked past a bin without inspecting the contents. <laughs> the collection of ephemera and items he amassed have formed the basis of the exhibition you can see downstairs. And now he will talk through some of these treasures from this kingdom of cardboard. So thank you and over to you, Bob. Thank you, Becky. I joined the BBC in the spring of 1977. <clears throat> and I'd been there about a fortnight when I was walking through the, um, the back gates on my way home and spotted in the scenery dock a seven foot high polystyrene map of the United Kingdom. And it was for a program called Your Songs of Praise Choice, presented by Thora Heard. Now this map was an exquisite piece of sculpture, but for every cathedral, on the map, there was a little oval vignette, which was a pen and ink drawing that had then been hand colored. And in the presentation studio, as Thora heard linked to each of the clips, the camera slowly zoomed into one of these illustrations. It was a fantastic piece of work and I was able to look at it close up. The next day, it was in a skip at the back of television center, broken in two, because its purpose had been served. That was the end of it really. Um, I climbed into the skip and I peeled off all of those little vignettes and I still have them at home in an album because I just thought it was a terrible waste. So much work had gone into the creation of this thing and it was now just, just rubbish. Uh, so I spent all of my time at the BBC, a great part of it, um, rummaging through bins and skips and taking home what was practical. Some of the material was just too large or too heavy, uh, too bulky. So what you see downstairs in the display cabinets is a part of it. Some of the other items are still at home in storage. A um, little bit of background information really about the BBC. As you know, this year is the BBC centenary. Uh, the corporation opened its doors for business on the 18th of October, 1922. And I am told, I've just found out this afternoon, the BBC centenary celebrations really kick off on the 18th of October. And there'll be a month of special programming. Um, one of which is a, an edition of the Antiques Roadshow, which features a number of the items downstairs. I haven't got a transmission date yet. They specifically said, don't heavily promote it until it's in Radio Times. So I'll, I'll say no more about that. So the BBC started on the 18th of October, 1922, as the British Broadcasting Company. Um, it wasn't yet a corporation operating under a, a royal charter. It was actually um, an assembly of radio manufacturers who had to produce programs for this new medium, and they had to raise money to do that. Initially, when um, the BBC was founded as the company, there were um, many applications for licenses. Over 200 were received, and the government, looking to America, and at the mess that the Americans had made of introducing national and, and local radio stations, decided not to award 200 licenses, but to give a single license to the BBC. And so they started as uh, the only radio broadcaster in this uh, country. In fact, the first broadcast actually had taken place two years earlier um, in 1920 with Dame Nellie Melba, fortified by Melba toast and a peach Melba ice cream. Um, but the government was deeply concerned that these transmissions could interfere with military and civil communications. And so they insisted that there were no further experimental transmissions of this kind. Uh, the license, as I said, was issued to the BBC. 
and it was to be supported by a levy obtained from the sale of all wireless sets. In fact, things didn't work out as planned. The listening public made their own radio receivers, so the levy failed to materialize and generate the essential funds necessary to provide the expected service. Um, a listener could simply construct a very basic wireless set known as a cat's whisker, and these kits were available very, very cheaply. The most expensive element was a pair of headphones, but even they were not very expensive. The British Broadcasting Company struggled financially, and the government had to have a rethink. The solution was to introduce a radio license, and this restructuring of the organization provided the funding um, which allowed production of programs for the listening audience. It didn't matter whether you'd made your radio set yourself or bought it, the, the levy applied, sorry, the, uh, the license fee was necessary. And so um, that's where the funding came from. In 1925, a young Scots engineer, John Logie Baird, was able to send live moving pictures by wireless for the very first time. He demonstrated his system at Selfridge's department store in Oxford Street. The initial results were disappointing, but encouraging. And so he formed a company to develop this process. Baird was able to televise a live person speaking a year later and images of his ventriloquist's dummy, which he nicknamed Stooky Bill. Baird's experiments came to the attention of the BBC, and John Reith, the director general of the newly founded corporation, um, fundamentally disapproved of television as frivolous and insubstantial, but he realized the potential of the new medium. And under pressure, the BBC agreed to sponsor Baird's experiments and to provide studio facilities from the late summer of 1929. After a brief spell in the newly opened broadcasting house, the experimental bed TV studio was set up at 16 Portland Place, and the BBC's medium wave radio transmitters were used to distribute television signals outside of the normal broadcasting hours. Bizarrely, the pictures and the sound had to be sent separately because of the limits of, of the bandwidth available. And so viewers would see 15 minutes of moving pictures, mute, followed by 15 minutes of the corresponding sound um, <laughs> with no vision. It was the only way that it could be done at the time. The resolution was poor. It was just 30 lines in vertical portrait format. Landscape would come much, much later. And the pictures are so crude that special makeup was needed, as you can see here. Um, the makeup was dark blue and had to outline the contours of the human face because of the low resolution of the television receiver. Here we have Stooky Bill on the left and on the right, as the viewers would have seen him in 1930, 1929, when the experiments were being carried out. Um, if they were watching, they would have been watching on a televisor. This is the first commercially produced television set designed by Baird and made by his company. Um, enormously expensive, it cost £26 in 1929. That's equivalent to about £1,800 today. Now, bearing in mind that those experimental transmissions took place very late at night, when radio had finished for the day, uh, viewers would have been confronted with this thing, Stooky Bill, gazing silently from a tiny screen four by two inches, and Stooky Bill's leering visage was hardly conducive to a good night's sleep. Um, those of you who are horror film aficionados will see similarities between Stooky Bill on the left and the puppet from the Saw horror franchise, coincidentally called Billy. By the way, the term viewer didn't exist in 1929. The Daily Express had to run a competition to find a name for the people who were watching the new medium. Um, they were provisionally known as lookers in. Suggestions included these. Televist, beholder, bearder, invider, telegazer, visualizer, and telepreceptor. Fortunately, viewer won the day. Uh, Baird's experiments, experiments had included televising the Derby in 1931, and the very first television play, The Man with a Flower in His Mouth, by Pirandello, in 1930. The top-named stars of the day, such as Gracie Fields and Arthur Askey, all took part in test transmissions. It quickly became obvious that some kind of test signal had to be required when there were no live performances. So Baird's engineer, Desmond Campbell, built a graphics camera. And this is it in the Baird studio. The, 
The item on the left of the screen there with a red ring around it is called a Nipkoff disk and it was a mechanical scanner that was used to scan the images that you can see on the right hand side. Um, the graphics camera looked at a revolving carousel which had 12 postcard sized slots into which an assortment of different captions could be mounted. And this shows the caption, the caption camera in action. This photograph was taken in August 1932, four years before the world's first high definition TV service was actually launched. And this is the very first BBC television network symbol. Um, I don't think it's been seen publicly before tonight because the only image that actually exists is on that revolving drum and the only image I know of the drum is a newspaper photograph and the dots make it very difficult to, to make it out. So this is what viewers would have seen when they had their televisor switched on if there were no live pictures coming through. That original graphic was painted by a commercial artist in the fashionable Art Deco style. Um, and it was radiated to viewers mainly here in the southeast of England. Um, long before spinning globes, balloons, and performing hippos, we had this. Now, look especially at the all-seeing eye at the center of the symbol. Um, that would be retained as the central icon of the BBC's first animated network symbol in December 1953. But we'll, we'll talk more about that a little later. The graphics carousel would actually serve the BBC for over half a century in one form or another. Apologies for the poor quality of this. This is the BBC News Studio at Alexandra Palace in 1956, where they had a seven foot high version of the carousel, rather like the London Eye, and that could accommodate 16 images. And in a live news bulletin, the operator on the left would turn the carousel through a 16th so that the next caption was in front of the camera um, ready for use and that was used throughout the 1950s. It's not ancient history. A lot has happened in the last three, 30 or 40 years, really. Um, a very similar carousel was still in use in the BBC Sports Studio in 1986, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So pre-war television lasted just under three years. On the 1st of September 1939, concerned that the television signal from Alexandra Palace could provide a homing beacon for German warplanes the government closed the BBC television service for the duration of the conflict. The last program to be shown was a Mickey Mouse cartoon called Mickey's Gala Premiere, which was transmitted in full and not cut short in the middle as many accounts have reported. When television resumed after the war, the BBC still didn't have a graphic design department. Indeed, they didn't officially have a graphic designer until December 1954 when John Sewell a graduate of Hornsey and the Royal College of Art was appointed. Uh, we'll talk more about John a little later. The unsung hero of post-war BBC graphic design was an Austrian refugee called Alfred Wormser. And that's him there. Alfred was Jewish and as Hitler marched into Austria, Alfred marched out of Vienna, arriving in London in 1938. He found work as a factory manager making light bulbs but as a result of incorrect paperwork, he was interned as an enemy alien, taken by car to Southampton and deported to Australia, uh, where he was retained, detained until 1941. By then, with the mistakes having been resolved, Alfred came back, back to London, where he joined the Pioneer Corps. Rising to the rank of Major, his excellent command of written and spoken English found him recruited by the War Office as a translator at the post-war Nuremberg trials of Nazi war criminals. He returned to Germany after the war to assist with legal paperwork. But by 1950, he had carved himself a niche for, uh, with, BBC, with the BBC television service as their main graphic designer. He was a model maker, a cartoonist, an animator, um, working primarily at Lime Grove Studios, but elsewhere as required. Alfred also illustrated a large number of books, uh, many of which uh, you can buy quite cheaply online. This great bear of a man who tipped the scales at 17 stones was a tough disciplinarian. Live television demanded it, but his sense of humor was legendary and he was a great prankster. One BBC producer recalls trying to lift his briefcase at the end of the working day, only to find it filled with cast iron stage weights weighing as much as he did. Um, Alfred was an inspired genius, always finding new ways to display information, 
in a dynamic and visually arresting style. For general election coverage, he went to Hamley's and bought their entire stock of 1,500 ping pong balls, which he painstakingly hand painted in black and shades of gray to represent the state of the parties as the results came in. <coughs> Loaded into clear perspex tubes, they showed the results in an easily understandable form in the years before the swingometer, which was designed by Peter Milne, but built by Alfred Wormser. Black and white television presented some very specific challenges, uh, not only in the designs of sets and costumes, but also for graphic designers. Shades of gray were very important. Alfred Wormser designed most of his animations in black, white, and five shades of gray, as they were intended to be viewed in monochrome. Color was not used because the tonal value of many colors looked identical on black and white TV. John Ryan, the creator of Captain Pugwash, followed the same rules, painting only in shades of gray for his early animations. A purple jacket with red buttons and a brown color looked completely black. So it was much safer to work entirely in shades of gray. It was the safest way to be sure of a clear separation of, of tones. Such was Wormser's fame that the style of animation he devised was known for many years within the BBC as Wormseries. In a 1956 edition of Panorama, Richard Dimbleby went behind the scenes uh, and introduced Alfred Wormser to the viewing public and revealed that the animated program graphics were indeed known across the corporation as Wormseries. Alfred was born on the 26th of January 1912 and was 28 years old when he arrived in London. If you want to see his showreel, go to YouTube and type in BBC Facts and Figures 1957. Now, <clears throat> I found that sometimes YouTube doesn't want to show this. If anybody has difficulties finding it, drop us an email and we'll send you an alternative link. That's a tiny URL link. Um, if you make a record of that, you can find his stuff quite easily. What you see on that clip will astound you, particularly when I tell you there was no videotape, it is not edited, and that 15-minute sequence was entirely live and flawless without a hiccup. Ten animators worked on the program, pulling cardboard tags, sliding sheets of stiffened gauze, releasing elastic bands to produce instantaneous cuts and animations. And an old theatrical trick known as Pepper's Ghost was used to generate seamless animations using half-silvered mirrors and sheets of glass, all done in real time. Um, we haven't got time to show it, but it really is worth, worth a look. <coughs> it was cardboard engineering of the highest order. You can see some examples of Alfred's work downstairs in the exhibition, where the only surviving classified football results board from Grandstand is currently on display. And I have to thank John Tidy, the retired managing director of Alfred Wormser's company for his generosity in lending material to us for display. The BBC had a department in the 1950s, in the very early 1950s, which designed sets for television productions. Graphics was regarded as just another part of the same discipline executed primarily by gentlemen like this, sign writers, commercial artists, all male. Their responsibilities covered every aspect of lettering, shop fronts for studio sets, gravestones, closing credits, manuscripts, title cards, and so on. Their work was supplemented by using a commercial press known as a Masili, made by a London manufacturer called Masson Seeley, who were based in Victoria. Masili machines were initially designed to produce point-of-sale promotional material for department stores. The BBC adapted them to churn out thousands of feet of closing credits every year. Worms has offered much greater flexibility and variety than the very limited in-house options available at the BBC in the immediate post-war period. <clears throat> About 40 years ago, I spoke to Bill Cotton about Alfred Wormser. Cotton was then the managing director of BBC Television and, and my boss at the top of the, the chain. Um, Bill directed a series called The Billy Cotton Band Show, which showcased the, the big band talents of his father, Billy Cotton Sr. For one sequence, Bill wanted a long corridor with a series of lavish double doors, each opening on cue to eventually reveal the singer, Kathy Kay, who would then burst into song as the final pair of doors revealed her. 
The estimate from scenic construction department ran to hundreds of pounds. Alfred Wormser built a model from cardboard and his staff opened the doors on cue with concealed tabs. Bill Cotton said the effect was stunning and the model cost about 30 quid. Uh, Wormser's ingenuity knew no bounds. He employed talented graphic artists who could hand letter in a variety of styles. One of these was Jack Harris, who had been employed for a while by British Gaumont Films at Lime Grove. When the BBC purchased the studios in 1949, Jack found himself painting horse racing results in the Grandstand Studio, the building where he had started his career all those years before. Alfred Wormser took out a mortgage on a large Victorian family house at 237 Goldhawk Road in Shepherd's Bush. It was 10 minutes from the new BBC studios at Lime Grove. And he really cornered the market in graphic design, model making. Um, he did virtually everything. Um, he did far more work for the BBC television service than the BBC's own design department in terms of graphic design work. Uh, his archive did survive until the mid-1980s, but when the house in Goldhawk Road was sold, my understanding is that most of it was destroyed uh, and only a small representative selection was retained. The Wormser Company would serve as BBC Productions for a half century or more, long after a thriving graphic design department had been established in-house. Alfred died on the 31st of January 1984, but the company continued long after his demise, but was sadly wound up about 11 years ago. Richard Levin, who was head of the BBC Scenic Design Group in the early 1950s, was well aware of the shortcomings of his department. He desperately wanted a dedicated team of graphic designers, but the management were reluctant to commit the funding needed. Levin, who was a gifted semi-professional photographer, made a photographic record of every caption which appeared on BBC television during the week. There was only one channel to worry about in 1953. He presented that portfolio to the board of management and was able to clearly illustrate the failings of the existing system. Although I haven't seen the report, I suspect that Alfred Wormser would have probably featured quite highly in, in Levin's uh, report as to how things might improve. The outcome of Richard Levin's appeal and presentation to BBC management was an agreement to fund one dedicated graphic designer. And in December 1954, John Sewell was appointed from Hornsey and the Royal College of Art. Um, graphic design department would consist of John Sewell alone for some years. It wasn't until 1963, almost a decade later, that a graphic design manager was appointed. And in fact, it was 1969 before the department officially had um, someone in charge who was known as head of graphic design. In 1953, when the head of Dutch television's graphic design department visited London to see the latest advances in TV design, he was directed by the BBC to go and speak to Alfred Wormser at 237 Goldhawk Road. When Jan van der Does returned to London three years later, on the 2nd of August 1956, he had an appointment with Richard Levin at 2.30 p.m. in the afternoon. Uh, John Sewell, the new designer, was in place by then and took the Dutchman for a tour of the department. His report survives. In BBC Photographics, he was shown how captions were created using standard metal printing types in very large display sizes. The type was painted matte black and the printing surface was picked out in white. It seems a bit Heath Robinson, but it worked beautifully. It worked extremely well. The letters were arranged by hand in a black tray, a matte black tray, and they were then photographed onto high contrast film. The film was then flipped to become right reading and printed as a photograph, 12 inches by nine inches, or turned into a 35 millimeter slide, depending upon the end use. Uh, we have an example of that process down, uh, downstairs on display in cabinet number one. According to the report, the 1953 report, <coughs> Only four very modern faces were available at the time um, in traditional letterpress um, type. The Masili system offered many more. By comparison, when I left the BBC graphic design print room in about 1985, by then we were pretty much electronic, uh, we had over 200 stock metal faces available. Uh, Masili had the brass nerve and the pun is intentional there, as their faces were often engraved in brass, 
to state in their publicity, it is with no little satisfaction that we state that our faces in this catalog were designed in our own art department. Not one of them actually was. Uh, they were all pirated, um, some of them quite recognizable. On the 1956 visit, Jan van der Does also describes the caption department in his report, where 12 men, no women, were employed as sign writers producing opening captions and end credits, many of which were hand lettered. A Masili machine was also used for businesslike, unpretentious, and delayed announcements due to circumstances. Masili's cricket and mascot typefaces were used on the early Quatermass serials. In truth, mascot was a, a copy of um, Jakob Erbar's Sans Serif, a German face, and the other one, uh, cricket, was a ripoff of Stevenson Blake's Granby. It's also, Granby itself is a ripoff of Edward Johnston's um, London underground alphabet. Uh, remarkably, all of the Quater mass metal types were still available to BBC designers in 1986, and my recollection is they showed very little signs of wear. Um, they were never used after Quater mass, from what I can gather. Quater mass had several distinctive title sequences. Quater mass 2 featured the serial title cut out of a sheet of cardboard, about 20 by 25. It was um, suspended over um, a tank of dry ice, which was backlit. Uh, the dry ice was in warm water, and the vapor swirled and bubbled through the aperture created by the words. If you want to see what this looks like, I, I can't stress what an incredibly valuable resource the Ravensbourne Motion Archive is, the BBC Motion Archive. You can see that quite a mass um, title sequence and others um, as they look in, in the form of moving pictures. So um, if you pick up a, a set of notes from the exhibition downstairs, you'll find the Ravensbourne web address on there. Um, you will lose several days on that site. When I first discovered it, I went through all the programs I remember from my childhood, Andy Pandy, um, Doctor Who in, in its many um, different variations, uh, it's a fantastic resource and um, one of the people responsible for it, Michael Graham Smith, I think is here tonight um, and he's to be congratulated on, on, on doing that. Thank you, Michael. Um, the designer of this title sequence for Quatermass is not actually recorded. A lot of the material on the Ravensbourne site is and the designers are identified. You can search by designer name if you want to do it that way. But there is no design accredited for any of the Quatermass title sequences. Um, it's possible that the set designers, Cliff Hatz, Clifford Hatz, um, may have been responsible, or Stuart Marshall, who was another set designer who worked on Quatermass. Um, or indeed, it might have been Alfred Mer Wormser, Jack Kine, or Bernard Wilkie from the visual effects department. Um, they all collaborated on this sort of work. And this, of course, the early Quatermass serials were made in the days before there was a graphic design department. So it was um, whoever was available and who could take the job on. Um, I wish I had spoken to Stuart Marshall about the early Quatermass titles. Uh, he, I had a nodding acquaintance with him. He worked at the BBC in the same building that I was in. Uh, and I knew him really just from chatting to him in the tea bar. Uh, I'm not even sure if Stuart's still around, but he'd be very elderly if he is. Uh, by the late 1950s, the Masili machine <coughs> was the workhorse of BBC Graphics for credits. The machines were operated by technical staff and designers were not allowed to touch them. There were union agreements on pain of a trade union walkout if a designer was caught um, using a Masili. When the Doctor Who title sequence designer Bernard Lodge did a bit of covert Masili printing, he was caught and reprimanded by Richard Levin, head of design department, who said, what the hell is my 1,500 pounds a year designer doing using a Masili? I think, um, yes, we can move on to, uh, no, we're still in the 1950s. In the early 1950s, the BBC commissioned a special report on screen typography from the printing historian and typographer and a great fan of um, St. Bride Library, <coughs> a great supporter of the library. Harry Carter produced this report, which is here at St. Bride. I've seen it. I saw it about 10 years ago. Trying to find it again in time for this talk. I'm sorry to say there are 10 very large boxes of Harry Carter's papers, and I wasn't able to, uh, to locate it, but I will continue looking for it. 
The gist of Harry's report is use bold sans serifs. And that was really down to the 405 line television system. Uh, there were issues with uh, typefaces which had fine serifs, especially dynamic uh, captions, those which had to roll or crawl, um, where you would get sometimes something called an interpolation error where the, the serifs would flicker on and off. So, as I say, the gist of Harry's report, <coughs> as I remember it, is use sans serifs. I was a graphic assistant at the BBC. I was never a designer. Uh, there was a pecking order uh, with a senior designer, of which I think there were four. Were there four? Uh, be below each senior designer, there was a group of designers, a, a dozen or so, and then there were assistant designers. And right at the bottom of the pile, there were the graphic assistants. Uh, we did a great deal of printing. Um, a lot of captions were produced using either letterpress types or hot foil systems. Graphic designers created title sequences. They defined a graphic style for each series. The graphic assistants would then manage the basic program content for much of the run. <coughs> I did hundreds of end credits sequences for programs like EastEnders and Heidi High. <coughs> but I also had great fun as the person responsible for the scoring and graphics on Mastermind for 16 years, traveling the length and breadth of the UK. Um, that's me in the black chair at St. Magnus's Cathedral in Orkney. Mastermind was a wonderfully, wonderfully friendly production and I still remain in contact with some of the old team 25 years after Magnus Magnusson's last show. Letraset, um, whose design archives are here at St. Bride, thanks to Dave Ferry and his colleagues, uh, 164 boxes of original ruby liths, all stored upstairs in our main book stack. Um, very much a designer's tool. It could look very good indeed, but it couldn't be applied quickly enough to cope with the enormous demand for end credit sequences in particular. At its peak, our unit turned out eight or 10 sets of credits, closing credits every day, seven days a week, for network productions such as Film 82, Juliet Bravo, or Songs of Praise. Series logos could be incorporated into these Masili printed captions, and I kept many of these, some of which you can see downstairs. A paper closing roller caption was somewhere between six and 20 feet long, depending on whether it was a 30 minute sitcom or a lavish opera. Printed on very strong, specially milled craft paper, around 180 grams in weight, the surface was an extremely matte black, almost a velvety surface, which reflected no light, and the credits were printed in white. The color was then added through the vision mixing desk, if color was indeed required, uh, in the studio where the captions were being used. Black edges, drop shadows, surrounds could all be generated electronically. Occasionally we worked in color. Um, for some mothers do have them. Uh, we had to print those credits on very, very long strips of yellow paper in red, and they were then glued onto a black roller caption. It was a real faff. It was a nightmare when the requisition used to come in for that. We only realized some years later that you didn't even need to do that. You could have just printed on a, on a roller that was all yellow and then the vision mixer could have used a wipe, but um, we got paid more for doing it the complicated way, <laughs> or at least the department did. <clears throat> I remember the day when a producer from BBC Community Programs called to see us with representatives from his current production. The Open Door series handed over control of a studio and all of its technical facilities to small groups of sometimes rather odd individuals. Um, the guest program makers that week arrived with an end roller caption that they'd made from wallpaper. Very nice wallpaper too. Um, but it wouldn't go through the roller caption machine because it was simply not strong enough. And when they tried to run the end credits, uh, it fell apart. So <coughs> the remains of the roller were brought into our unit and we had to paste it onto a, a standard roller caption substrate to make it work. It all looked very avant-garde. Um, <clears throat> which brings me to the topic of BBC television idents. Sorry, I mean symbols. The BBC didn't have idents, it had symbols. And every presentation script said, as it does here, symbol. Um, same for BBC Two, as you can see there, it says symbol, six seconds, here on BBC One, the Sunday film, and so on. <clears throat> um, the BBC One symbol, which we can see next, changed over the years, that's, that's one of the later mechanical ones. 
Um, <coughs> When I worked in presentation department, they were all mechanical models. And the earliest was designed and built by Abraham Games, long before my time, for a fee of 200 guineas in 1953. And this is Abraham Games with the actual model, which I believe still exists. Is that right, Simon? I think it's still kicking around. Yeah, I believe his daughter, Naomi, still has the original model. Um, it was enormously unreliable. The original intention was that that symbol would revolve continuously. It would be used to go into a, into a BBC program, but um, it just didn't work. Nicknamed the Bat Wings, it went live for the first time on the 2nd of December, 1953, and promptly broke down. Uh, the model was a Heath Robinson construction of brass wire, pulleys, and wheels. Um, it was extremely unreliable, so it was filmed onto 35 millimeter stock and then replayed from Telecine. Games was paid an additional 70 pounds for designing a network clock, something which is sadly lacking today. Um, it's a great many years since you will have seen a BBC One or a BBC Two clock on air, and that's because of changes to the transmission distribution system. Uh, unfortunately, because of our television signals going via satellites and the internet, um, a clock today would never ever be accurate. It could be up to four or five seconds out. And depending on whether you're watching on a phone or watching on a widescreen TV, um, they would all be showing different times. So clocks, sadly, are no more. The Batwings model was built by J.F. Johnson at the Royal College of Art, but was never satisfactory. The public didn't much like it, nicknaming it the thing, the staring eye, the cockeyed wonder. And you can see at the center of it, there's an eye, very much like that original 1932 ident. In the cabinet downstairs, cabinet number one, you'll find a copy of a letter sent to the editor of the News Chronicle, um, giving a very strange viewer's verdict on what he thought of the design. <coughs> the only reliable way of using the animated symbol was to play it into the network from 35 millimeter film. More often than not, a 35 millimeter slide was used. The model was rarely seen because of its temperamental behavior. But nevertheless, the game's batwing symbol survived until 1960, when it was replaced for three years with a map of the United Kingdom. The first spinning world was introduced in 1963 and survived for 22 years until 1985 through various iterations. Uh, until we reached the cow, in 1985, the BBC replaced mechanical models with a computer generated symbol, the cow, the, co the computer originated world. But, as I discovered very recently, this was not the BBC's first cow ident. I did a bit of digging and found this cow from 1975. <laughs> uh, and that was made for a comedy sketch series called Rutland Weekend Television uh, by the designer Graham McCallum, who came up with this version of a network symbol for a rural television uh, uh, station which was supposed to be in Britain's smallest county. It's based very much upon the original mechanical symbol. It even has a strip of Mirrolon, which is a flexible polymer reflective material in the background to create a, a distorted reflection. During my years with the presentation department, I took many family members and friends to look around TV center. The place was always full of celebrities and there was much excitement to be had for visitors who spotted the stars. Um, having said that, the one thing that everyone remembers is their visit to the little Noddy room, where the remote-controlled camera, nicknamed Noddy, provided pictures of the spinning world symbol. You can just see it to the left there, about halfway down the screen. That was the model. We would stand quietly, huddled in semi-darkness, until a couple of minutes before a live continuity link, where Noddy's headlamps would illuminate, and he would swing round to face the BBC One symbol, <coughs> there are 12 locations, 12 potential locations in the Noddy um, unit. And the motor beneath the symbol would be switched on by the announcer. It was very, very loud, as you'll hear shortly. And on a little monitor next to us, we could see what the viewers at home were watching. A crisp electronic image in navy blue and gold with white lettering. This is what it looked and sounded like in reality.
this afternoon on BBC One and Vision One. Not what you expected, I guess. That's one of the original surviving BBC One symbols uploaded to YouTube, I think, by Gareth Randall, who deserves, deserves a mention for that. There are quite a few of the BBC One mechanical globes surviving uh, because every region had one and every national um, centre uh, in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and so on. <clears throat> BBC Belfast, I think, have theirs on display in reception. The colours were all synthesised by a gadget called a Cox box, which could generate up to three colours in place of the monochrome pictures from the Noddy camera. In front of us in that tiny room in the presentation department was a rather tatty metal box with much evidence of retouched paintwork with visible screws and bits of acetate film. The mechanical symbol was much more reliable than the bat wings and rarely broke down. During my time in the presentation department, which was about three and a half years, I can only recall a single mechanical failure when a 35 millimeter standby slide had to be used. The BBC network clock was also a cardboard and metal model. And you can see an actual size mock-up of the clock in the exhibition cabinet downstairs. The original BBC One legend ringed here in Futura Bold. Um, that's the 1974 symbol is also downstairs in the exhibition. Not the spinning world, but the, the, the strip which has BBC One on it. It was retrieved from a, a dustbin in the presentation department when the typeface was changed in 1981. I was working in presentation. We were doing some trails for BBC One. I was doing the captions on the trails. And a little man came in and said, I've got the new BBC One typeface. And he had a screwdriver in his hand. And he went into the Noddy room. And he removed the strip in Futura and he replaced it with a new version, which had the stripes that you saw earlier, and promptly dropped it into the bin next to me. And I said, can I have it? Um, so it's downstairs. But that's what happened with so much material. The BBC is a, a broadcaster. It's not a museum. It didn't have storage space for all the things that are downstairs. And of course, they ended up in the bin. Let's look at what was happening on BBC Two in the 1960s. The network opened up in 1964 with a static caption ident. Uh, although there was a black and white 35 millimeter film sting on film, but rarely used. It usually just sat there not doing very much. In 1967, the first cube version appeared. Um, that was on film initially, played in from a 35 millimeter telecine machine. It was an animated ident, but as with the back bat wings, you had to keep a telecine operator on standby, and so a 35 millimeter slide was quite often used. Um, in 1969, a new version of the Cube appeared. This is the one that's behind us here. And that was the work of BBC designers Sid Sutton and Alan Jeeps. Uh, I think Sid is still around. I, I, I know that Alan died a few years ago. Um, like the BBC One symbol, the spinning world, BBC Two used a model and a noddy caption camera. And that is the actual BBC Two um, symbol that was used um, throughout the 1960s and 70s. Um, the revolving cube was withdrawn in 1974 and it was then stored on a high shelf in the main presentation office, room 4088 at Television Centre. <coughs> in 1979, concerned that this heavy metal box might fall and injure someone, they were given to BBC Enterprises um, for possible exhibition use. By then I was in Enterprises in the exhibitions department and we stored them. We stored them for three years. And then we were told that we had to share a warehouse with BBC Records, who had an enormous stock of vinyl singles and albums. And we had to make space for them. And my boss said, we have to have a clear out. We're going to get rid of a lot of stuff. And we drove over there one weekday afternoon. And amongst the things that were thrown away were this and the BBC Schools symbol, which was an animated thing that had a countdown. Um, I was traveling home on the tube that night and I just couldn't bear the thought of all this stuff sitting in a skip. So I got the key from the television rehearsal rooms and I went back and collected that. And I couldn't carry it, it was too heavy, I was on the tube. So I had to strip out the central part um, and that's what you have there. The housing downstairs is, is a modern replacement, but at least it survives. <coughs> you can see the original 1969 to 74 cube on display in the cabinet downstairs in the Leighton room. Um, I have to say it's quite underwhelming. It's, it's really quite small. 
1974, a new BBC Two symbol was introduced, made from alter alternating slices of gray and white metal on a black cylinder. Uh, that revolved to assemble a, a symbol from slices. It was another mechanical model, and the final example to be used by the network. It lasted until 1973, uh, sorry, 1979, when the first computer animated two was introduced. But that's, that's enough of computers for now. The BBC graphic design department also employed professional sign writers, caption artists, if you like. Morris Plum and Bill Hodgins were the two I remember, gifted traditional sign painters. They could turn their hands to most things. I remember Morris's little studio on the mezzanine floor of the scenery block at TV Centre, which later became my office, shared with my colleagues. Signs would often be propped up outside, drying. There were Victorian shop fronts and polystyrene gravestones, artfully aged and festooned with moss and lichen. Downstairs, you'll find this piece of Morris's work in the shape of an illuminated police public call box sign, hand-painted onto perspex. There were four of them. I think you can probably guess why they were painted back in 1980. For the second TARDIS police box prop, the first one having fallen apart after 17 years traveling through time and space. The sign downstairs survives because it was broken and it was dumped in a tea chest full of junk. If you look closely in the exhibition, you can see that bottom right-hand corner is replaced with a, a patch made, of course, from cardboard. Um, I believe the other three were then redeployed on TARDIS Mark III. When Bill and Morris retired from the graphic design department, um, the department bought a computer-controlled vinyl cutting machine. It could cut almost any typeface, true type or postscript. Sadly, it wasn't very good at aging things, and by then the experts had been made redundant. Some of the scenic painters were highly skilled at making a studio set look lived in by spray spraying a dilute gray wash around light switches, picture frames, above fireplaces to create a patina of age which convinced. A permanent fixture in the BBC club for many years was Harry, a retired show worker who used to describe himself to anybody who would get close enough to listen as the best dirtier downer in the business. And he was probably right. In the late 1960s, the BBC developed its own electronic character generator, and they had a working prototype for the moon landing in 1969. In typical BBC acronym style, it was known as Anchor, the Anchor Numeric Character Origination Equipment. And there it is um, on a BBC Two program called News Review. <coughs> this monospaced design was functional, functional but ugly, but it was a first rather wobbly step uh, towards electronically generated graphics. Anchor was useful for instant captions, but would never have won any beauty contest. It was free. There were no internal charges made for its use. So productions could have it for nothing if they chose to, uh, to use Anchor. Uh, nobody wanted it, which really upset the engineers. They thought they'd come up with something quite wonderful. Uh, the only people who used it regularly were the presentation department for emergency captions and news which subtitled this program, News Review for the Deaf. Anchor would eventually lead to more flexible electronic systems, um, which was another nail in the cardboard coffin. BBC Graphics sold me to the sports department in 1981 on a special contract, and I quickly found myself part of the grandstand and match of the day graphics team. I don't know what the transfer fee was, probably about a fiver. Um, my sport colleagues and I provided electronic elements for sports, live sports programs, name supers, name captions for guests, and a handful of uh, full-frame captions in the early days. But the backbone of BBC Sport Graphics in the early 1980s was still Alfred Wormser. He was still there, remember him? From 1938, <clears throat> Wormser's held multiple sports contracts to service productions because they were flexible in a way that BBC Graphics couldn't be initially. For starters, they worked all the hours required of them without quibbling. Every weekend, late nights for sports night, match of the day. 20 day stints without breaks for the Olympics and Commonwealth Games. Alfred had retired by 1984, uh, but one of his longest serving staff, John Tidy, who had been part of the Wormser team when Grandstand started in October 1958, led the company into the 21st century. Remember the Tom Bowler that we saw earlier? used by John Logie Baird for experimental captions in 1932. 
Well, here it is again, and this photograph was taken in 1986, 54 years later. It was still in regular use for racing, racing results. Um, these were hand-painted at incredible speed by Worms' as caption artists. Uh, Jack Harris was one of the best, although the man in this photo is John Court. Um, Fred Elms was in the picture before putting the result into the tombola. Jack or one of his colleagues would be handed a scrap of paper uh, with the horse race results, which viewers had just seen live. First number one, 17, the first number 17, Tudor star, five to four favorite, etc. cetera. Um, the race was always followed by an interview with the jockey, the owner, or the trainer. That was absolutely essential. So the stage manager would be running around, just grab somebody in front of the camera. Why? Because Jack needed time to paint the result. So some of those, those, those interviews were purely to allow the caption artist enough time to, to get the result painted. Um, when the one, two, three was ready, it went in front of a camera on a music stand. Woe betide anybody who smudged the paintwork en route to the caption tumbler. Um, like our old friend Noddy, the captions for horse racing and many other sports programs were monochrome, and the colors, in this case a vivid yellow-orange, were synthesized electronically through the vision mixing desk. The tombola allowed a sequence of results to be played by tumbling the device in vision while Wormser's staff frantically removed and loaded the latest results at the back of the device, trying not to wobble it as they did so. The original tumbler is downstairs on the windowsill in the exhibition room. Uh, more sport material, by the way, survives than general BBC material because Wormser's, proud of their history, preserved a small museum of their greatest hits. We printed thousands of captions every year on paper and cardboard. The standard size of a television caption before the days of widescreen TV was 12 inches by nine inches. They were universally known as 12 by nines. This translates into four units wide, three units deep, known in Hollywood as the Academy format. Stock typefaces often dictated the look of a series. Cooper Black was in stock long before Dad's Army. Um, the same is true of old style antique used on faulty towers. And I, I sometimes wonder um, whether programs, certainly the end credits of programs, look the way they do because the designer was restricted in the faces he could use. Certainly in later years with photo setting and digital, um, it was much easier to have a, a wide choice. But for a lot of classic series like um, Are You Being Served? Um, Dr. Finley's Casebook, these are all stock typefaces which came from the material that was available um, without any additional expenditure. A roller caption was exactly 12 inches wide uh, to fit the standard roller caption machines. And with around 200 metal typefaces in stock, our designers, uh, designer colleagues were encouraged to use in-house faces to save money. Some preferred photo setting, which provided a substantially larger range of faces. External companies such as Panache, Alphabet, and Conway's could also manipulate faces optically, um, apply filters and textures which were not possible um, in-house, It's certainly not in the printing department. The great disadvantage with externally photoset captions was trying to correct a mistake in the studio at short notice. If a caption was misspelled, uh, the producer was effectively lumbered with it. We worked shift and were available until 9.30 every night, including Christmas Day, and all of the graphic assistants had an art bin with the materials needed to make corrections if necessary. A replacement name patch could be printed quickly in the workshop for a roller caption made in-house, rushed to the studio and stuck over the, mis the mistake. The edges of the patch had to be very carefully blackened with the biggest marker pen you've ever seen uh, to prevent the cut edges flaring. The markers had a nickname, which even the female assistants gleefully used. We called them donkey dicks. I'm not sure we'd get away with that today. About half of our typeface stock was made by Masili. The other half was acquired from Stevenson Blake in Sheffield or prominent German type foundries, manufacturers of metal printing types. Differences in continental type sizes were easily accommodated by the Masili process in a way which isn't possible with standard letterpress machines. Letterpress display faces in 36 point and larger were purchased and cut down from the standard 0.918 inches to a quarter of an inch, which was the Masili standard height for type. 
The actual size of a typeface on screen was determined by the designer using a series of printed acetate graticules that were known as field size grids. And that told the photographic unit how the image should be framed, whether that word should fill the screen or should be a, a tiny part of the bottom of the screen. <coughs> Original letter set faces could also be engraved in metal if a production had a, a large budget. It, it was done at very high cost, between four and 500 pounds. At the closure of the BBC's printing unit in 1985, all of the stock and some of the machines were donated to the Printing House Museum in Cockermouth in Cumbria. Sadly, the floods of 2009 destroyed virtually all of it, and contamination with raw sewage meant that nothing could be saved. Graphic props were a big part of the cardboard era. We used our Masili machines to pr produce all sorts of items, uh, including props that were to be used, um, handled, or for set dressing. We did a fine range of passports with plates to print the crests and the covers of all major nations, and a few odd ones like the straight settlements, labels for non-existent whiskey brands, and these things, Toblerones. We printed Toblerones galore, not the chocolate bars, bank managers' desks, sitcoms, these triangular nameplates were a regular requirement and the pink requisitions used to come in almost every week for one of those. Money was also printed from time to time. On one occasion, it was old-fashioned white fivers, and on another, it was wartime Belgian currency for Secret Army, I think. Both jobs, sadly, attracted the attention of Scotland Yard, and we had two very embarrassing visits from the fraud squad, having been shopped by our process engraver. The money was printed, but beneath the, wrapper, the paper bands wrapped around each bundle, uh, we had to overprint the words, stage money for film and TV use, in 36-point gill sands. They weren't even very good copies, because even 625 line television was very forgiving in those days. The 1976 Doctor Who adventure, The Deadly Assassin, <coughs> also called upon our special printing skills. When Tom Baker's Time Lord Alter Ego visited his home planet, we got to see his superiors, resplendent in their velvet robes and huge fiberglass collars. We printed the gold Celtic knots, which um, were hot foiled onto acetate for that job. The block survives, and that's downstairs in the display, along with a microphone badge or two for Maplin's holiday camp. We printed lots of Maplin's badges, because many ended up in the icy waters of the Olympic-sized swimming pool. Uh, the series was filmed out of season at Dovercourt uh, near Harwich when the camp was closed to holidaymakers. Um, so that Olympic-sized swimming pool was damned cold in, in late autumn, early winter. Although we didn't make the coveted Blue Peter badges, we printed logo stickers which appeared on John Noakes' safety helmet and many other branded props for the series. The end credits were also printed by myself and my colleagues, and you can see the ship logo uh, as used on the credits. There it is uh, for the crash zoom, the very final shot of every Blue Peter throughout the 70s and 80s and early 90s. Um, the Blue Peter ship, by the way, was designed by Tony Hart, the late Tony Hart, for a fee of £100 in 1963. Again, I was able to rescue the printing plate um, when we switched to elect electronic systems in 1985. Incidentally, Tony Hart initially asked for a royalty fee on each badge that was produced. Uh, program editor Billy Baxter wisely rejected that request in favor of a fixed fee. He would have been very wealthy indeed if he'd got his royalty. <clears throat> a regular job was also one of the most unusual ones. The end credits for That's Life were printed in universe onto strong cartridge paper, specially made for us in long rolls. The captions had gaps left between them so that the cartoonist Rod Jordan could insert his drawings, inspired by the contents of that week's program. Rod would come into the office to collect the printed roller, take it off to his studio at home in Beaconsfield, and return in time for the show on Saturday evening. I had one of his closing captions for many years, but sadly the colors were not light, light fast and slowly faded away. A talented and very generous man, um, Rod also designed my private press mark, a little character called the Ink Sprite, hence my email address. Uh, he's more of a printer's devil, uh, but to me, he's, he's always the Sprite. In 1981, I was asked to work on Mastermind as the scorer. The graphics kit was then very primitive. 
The bottom left score box used on screen was a GenSign device uh, adapted from a bedside alarm clock with flip over numerals. It often jammed, but the caption board had another box at the top and when it jammed, we used to swing the whole thing round through 180 degrees uh, and keep your fingers crossed that the standby one would, would also work. Um, mastermind contenders were identified by an animating caption in the early 1980s. Production always called this name, rank, and number. And these were um, produced using cardboard engineering. The series was inspired by a wartime in interrogation session when the producer, Bill Wright, was a prisoner of war. The captions were made by my colleagues, but very much in the style of Alfred Wormser's Wormseries. Cardboard strips were pulled out on cue, one after another, to, um, to reveal the details of the contender, um, occupation, and specialist subject. More cardboard engineering. There's a mock-up downstairs. None of the originals survive, unfortunately. By 1984, the series had gone all electronic, although I remained a part of the production team until the final final in St. Magnus's Cathedral in Kirkwall, Orkney. The BBC didn't want to go to Orkney because it was much too expensive to fly the crew there from London. As an adoptive Scot born in Iceland, Magnus Magnusson was very keen to record his very last mastermind in Scotland. BBC management refused point blank for reasons of cost. Those of you with very good memories may remember that we did indeed record Magnus's last program at the Cathedral of St. Magnus in Orkney. You may also recall a lengthy scene setting sequence at the beginning of that program, uh, entirely filmed at Highland Park Distilleries with the company branding very clearly visible in all of the shots. I will draw a veil over how the money was obtained um, to allow that program to be made on location. By 1985, the days of cardboard were drawing to a close. The rapid developments of electronic systems such as Aston and Chiron, electronic character generators, <clears throat> and the remarkable Quantel paint box spelled the end for much traditional cut and paste material, hand lettering, and wormseries. The huge investment required for state-of-the-art computer systems meant that small independent companies such as wormsers could not raise the finance. Football and rugby, racing results, etc., were all brought back in house and became the responsibility of the BBC Computer Graphics Workshop and the BBC Graphic Design Department. Wormser's staff remained part of the package for their knowledge and their unique expertise. They were capable of scoring live Olympic curling, international badminton, and even trampolining. How do you score trampolining? They knew because they'd been doing it for years. Increasingly, the graphics for major sporting events became the responsibility of the host broadcaster, and sadly, Wormsers eventually closed down in 2011. I was retrained again and again on new systems. The last was a Norwegian-Israeli device called Viz. I hated it. I spent my time typing up football scores, a job which any of you could have been taught to do in a day or, day and day or two. <coughs> Making cardboard models, printing passports, using my hands and my brain became a thing of the past. When BBC Sport moved to Salford, I was invited to go with them. I declined. I'm glad I stayed in London because a few weeks after saying goodbye to the corporation, after 36 years service, I decided to visit one of my favorite haunts, St. Bride Library. I first used the reading room here in the spring of 1977. So when the acting librarian at the time, Holly Trant, said, would you like to join us as a volunteer? I said, yes. I thought it would fill a few months until my eventual retirement. Now, as my 68th birthday um, approaches, retirement eventually beckons. I will say thank you to the BBC for a fascinating career in cardboard management. And thank you to St. Bride for giving me a new purpose in old age. I hope to continue my association with the library in a reduced capacity from the new year. The reading room remains one of my favorite haunts and yours too, I hope. Just before we close, I'd like to mention an item which was brought to the library today by former BBC continuity announcer, Reg Sanders, who's in the front row. Um, when Reg left the BBC, he took with him a few souvenirs, including a cardboard caption kept in the BBC presentation standby cupboard for many years, but never used. 
I printed that caption in 1983 and Reg rescued it when he left. By a cruel coincidence, it turns out to be the most topical of all the pieces that I've shown this evening. Uh, thank you, Reg, and thank you all. <laughs> there it is. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much, Bob. That was just such a fascinating insight into the secrets behind TV. As a child of the 80s, some of that was very familiar, some not. Um, it's just absolutely brilliant, and I can't wait to re-watch it. So um, thank you very much. And from the applause in the room, I can tell everyone loved it as much as I did. And I know everyone on Zoom has been loving it as well. Um, we have got time for some questions. Um, I first had one, um, which is preempted <coughs> by something Bob was saying earlier. Um, because your props were absolutely brilliant, did any ever get you into a spot of bother or be um, mistaken for the real thing? Yeah, well, the, the, um, the money did. The money, as I mentioned twice, we had a fraud squad visiting us. Uh, and they, they had a sense of humor. I mean, they didn't come in with handcuffs. Um, they, it was very much, you know, what's all this then? Uh, you shouldn't be printing money. Um, but on another occasion, it wasn't a prop that I was involved with. Um, the BBC had an arts program called The Late Show, which went out after Newsnight. It came from a building on the television center site called the East Tower. And they did a feature one evening on an IRA poet uh, who'd been writing poetry about the Troubles. And the graphic designer, whose name I remember, but I won't mention it for the sake of not embarrassing him, uh, he decided the perfect backdrop for some of the, the quotes from the poems was a bomb. Uh, and so he fashioned um, an explosive device, which looked like a bundle of dynamite with a lump of blue tack that was supposed to be Semtex and some curly wires and an alarm clock. And that was the background for the text that he was um, using. The item was pre-recorded. He went home, and then the cleaners came in and found it in a bin. <laughs> and they rang security, who rang the bomb squad, and the building had to be evacuated. Um, and I think he was disciplined. I'm pretty sure he was. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, we have a couple of questions on Zoom, and then I'll go to the audience in the room. So Mike Edwards says, are there any cardboard applications that would still work better than the digital ones today? Um, the one thing that, when we started to go electronic, the one thing that we found very, very difficult to do was to zoom in. So you might start with the words quite small in the center of the screen and then zoom in. You could do that with a camera and a cardboard caption. You couldn't do it with some of the early electronic systems. They just weren't capable of doing that. Um, even when software started to be developed, um, the zooms were, were juddery. They were never very smooth. I mean, now you can do almost anything. So yeah, I mean, certainly for things like the closing zoom on the Blue Peter ship, uh, that was achievable on cardboard, but not achievable for a long time um, electronically. Great, thank you. Does anyone in the audience have a question? Yes, Simon, I'll bring the um, mic round. <coughs> uh, Bob, thanks very much. It's um, a wonderful combination of George Orwell and Blue Peter uh, that you, you give an impression of the BBC. Um, I just wondered, did you ever, did anybody ever talk about what was going on in commercial television at the same time? I seem to remember that while Blue Peter had its wonderful Tony Hart ship, uh, Magpie had a much, com coming from Thames Television in the Euston Road, had a much trendier approach to typography. Was, it, was there ever a discussion about what other broadcasters well, were doing? Some of my colleagues on grandstands um, jumped ship and went to World of Sport because the money was better. And World of Sport had a very similar set. So we'd be behind the presenters on grandstand and our colleagues were behind the presenters on World of Sport, and we, we would try and wave to them um, as tactfully as we could. Um, yes, we were aware of ITV graphics. And in fact, the, the type that I talked about earlier that was painted black and then painted white on the surface, ITV used exactly the same process. 
uh, for a number of years, I think later than the BBC. And John Eason, who's a printer friend of mine, um, John bought a, bought a load of type from LWT in the 1970s, went along to collect it and was astonished to find that it had all been painted black and the face had been painted white. Um, but yeah, there was an awareness, but um, not a great deal of overlap. I was aware, I mean, <clears throat> I have to say that some of the items downstairs survived because colleagues in graphic design department went to ITV. And when their offices were cleared, it wasn't unusual to see cardboard boxes in the corridor with a bit of paper saying, rubbish, please remove. Um, they'd gone, they'd taken the ITV shilling. Um, and this stuff was sitting in the corridor waiting for the cleaners to, to throw it into the skip. Uh, or a machine called the compactor in the car park, which crushed everything. Uh, so I would quite often get what I could. Um, it wasn't always, always easy, especially with larger things. There was a fantastic series that um, Graham McCallum did, which was uh, called Jane, and it was a combination of live action and painted backgrounds. And there were huge numbers of backgrounds that had been produced all by hand, and they were all stacked up in the corridor, again with a piece of paper saying, rubbish, please remove. I wish I'd had a bigger house. <laughs> I would have carried more home with me. Any other questions from anyone? Oh, yeah, I'll come and bring this round so everyone on Gazoom can hear. Get many viewers' complaints, nitpicking things about the wrong typeface or yeah. something that yeah, hadn't yeah, existed when yeah. it was broadcast. Yeah. There, there, like were, there were all sorts of complaints. The viewers complained about everything under the sun, but um, they would complain. When, when EastEnders started, um, Alan Jeeps, the graphic designer, chose Cheltenham as the typeface. And because the end credits of EastEnders had so many names, we had to use it at 16 scan lines high. And there were complaints from the viewers who said, this is just too small, we can't read it. Uh, and of course, um, at that size, all the crossbars on the cap A, the cap H, uh, they just disappeared. So we had to rework the typeface to make it work in, in such small sizes. But legibility was always a, an issue. So, I mean, you could have easily had a typeface that may not have been available when, in the period you needed it, you There were typefaces that we had licenses to use only once. Um, there was a typeface that was licensed called Handel Gothic, which was used for close encounters of the third kind. And we tried to buy it, and the, the company that produced it said, no, we don't want to sell it. Um, we will license it for single use. And so it was, I think it was for a Dawn French Jennifer Saunders sketch. And we used Handel Gothic once, but the font disc went into stock. And there was a note saying never to be used again. It should have been destroyed, but that was used accidentally. And we were hit with quite a, quite a large bill. I mean, a four-figure bill for that. Um, so, and the, one of the issues in later years was that uh, designers would download things from the internet, free fonts. And the, um, the person who was in charge of the purchase of digital typefaces in the department was a, a designer called Charles McGee. And Charles did all of the negotiations for, for instance, the use of Gil Sands as the corporate typeface. Charles got in touch with Monotype and... Um, I can't say too much, but it was too expensive initially, but by threatening to use a non-monotype version of Gil Sands, the price rapidly plunged, uh, and the BBC was able to use Gil Sands for about 25 years, I think. But yes, I mean, one of the issues was designers, certainly when, when the internet started to open up, designers finding typefaces online. And I, I have an email, a memo rather, at home, circulate, circulated by the head of graphic design department which says under no circumstances are typefaces downloaded from internet sources to be used on network production. Thank you. We still have today for many things working in the world of graphics, I think, <clears throat> and people on Twitter complaining about things, so not much has changed just the way we do it, maybe. Um, someone else over here had a question. I'm sorry, I couldn't see who it was. Yes. Hi there. Very interesting. Hey, when did the three-box BBC logo come in? When um, was that introduced? That was around, oh, wow, very early 1960s. But uh, initially it was, it was three rhomboid shapes, and then they rounded off the corners. So it was three rounded rhombuses. Um, and then it became three squares. I mean, it's, it's really been around for about 60 years in various forms, but there were multiple tweaks over the years to change the shape of it. 
Um, the typeface in the, the original version, uh, it's all very different now, but when Television Center was built, the architect, Graham Dorbarn, he chose for all the internal signage a typeface called Washington. Now, Washington is actually a Caslon typeface. Uh, it's, it's a late Victorian typeface, I think. And it's called Doric Italic. For some reason, the BBC decided to call the typeface Washington. It was used at Lime Grove and Television Center. All the wayfinding systems used Washington. <coughs> in fact, Washington is the name that Caslon used when the face was being sold in France. So we never quite got to the bottom of why the BBC were using a French name to describe a typeface, which was quintessentially English. Um, but those three rhombuses from 1960, 62, something like that, the typeface in the three rhombuses is Washington. It's the same typeface that's used for all the internal signage at Television Centre. I think we had one question. Um, was there much collaboration between um, the graphics department and the other great uh, institution of uh, BBC creativity, the Radiophonic Workshop? Um, not that I can remember. I don't think so. Uh, they were in a different building. They were at um, the music studios in Delaware Road in Maida Vale. So I lived in Maida Vale right opposite. So I used to eat at the studios regularly because it was good food and very cheap. But no, we, we didn't really have much, much contact. In later years, um, <coughs> when I worked for the exhibitions department, I had to produce the audio tapes that were used in the exhibitions, the Doctor Who exhibitions in particular. So I used to go along there and Dick Mills would record Dalek voices for me or K9's voice. So I knew some of the team over there, but um, not during my time in graphics. Great, yeah. we've got time for one more question. Yes, over here. Sorry, I'll, um, can you wait till we get, so the people on Zoom can hear it, sorry. Can you pass that down? Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, uh, in the future, do you think this will come back into use? Like, do you think as a kind of a retro style, do you think it will be used or? Um, I have seen um, odd uses of, of retro style graphics, but they, they, they do stand out because they're so different from the clean, um, how can I describe it kindly? I mean, uh, the graphics we were doing were, were not always perfect, um, but they had a sort of organic quality, uh, a more human quality than some of the computer generated material I see today. Um, there were periods as well when things went in and out of fashion, like three-dimensional lettering, which was chromium plated, uh, sort of got done to death in the 1990s. And new techniques that were being discovered in, in terms of electronic animation, everybody wanted to use them. And the, the difficulty was to try and make your version different from something you'd seen on another program. But yeah, I mean, there is a, there's a, a market for retro graphics of this kind, but generally not a, not a very big one. Brilliant. Um, I think that's the perfect place to end. I feel like we could chat all evening, um, but I'll let Bob have a little sit down and um, thank him again for such a brilliant evening. If anyone would like to carry on the conversation, sometimes we could head over to the Old Bell Pub, which is just through reception down the stairs and then it's the first left after the church sort of down the little alleyway so if you would like to join us there please do hope you all had a brilliant evening thank you again and hello and goodbye to everyone on zoom bob you've been brilliant and thank you all for coming cheers bye thank you, thank you.